right, welcome back everyone. So today's lineup, uh, I think we have three senior people and then the af after the afternoon session we'll have two junior people. Um, there's not much more for me to say. I think everyone's here and I noticed the alcohol was completely gone yesterday, so that's good news. So our first speaker is John King. It's a pleasure to welcome John King uh, to this workshop. He'll give a talk on multiple scales and exponentials. Thanks, John. Thank you. Oh, is the microphone working? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to do an embarrassingly simple problem. So this is probably the classical undergraduate example in multiple scales. I will try and say some new things about it. But I need to say a bit more by way of motivation, given how simple it is. So if you can caricature two extremes in dealing with asymptotics, one is to try and develop methods that are very generally applicable, which might mean having um, multiple trans series or whatever in your expansion. The other extreme, and I guess the tradition I come from, is where you try and fine tune your methods to the specifics of the problem you're dealing with. Um, so the, one of the reasons I've chosen this example is it includes strain coordinates as one um, technique, boundary layer theory slash matched asymptotics, multiple scales slash two timing, and then towards the end, I'm afraid, um, beyond all orders in the Stokes phenomenon. Um, so, I mean, uh, one example of that, it, it has been disconcerting coming from a uh, matched asymptotic background to see people writing down exponentials of both signs beyond an algebraic series, because at best it's only uh, on anti-Stokes lines that the two exponentials can both be subdominant. So if you're from my background, you do that by boundary layer theory instead. Okay, anyway, on, on to the specifics of the problem. Um, uh, I'm going to deal with it in terms of Rayleigh's equation. Van der Poel is slightly better known, but that's just the time derivative. I'm also actually running time in a slightly unconventional direction, but I'm going to go forward and backwards in time anyway, so that's not the main point. Um, epsilon's going to be small, which means the, um, the dissipation term, which switches sign, is small, but you can be in a situation where the positive dissipation balances the negative, and that's one of the key phenomena that come out of this equation. I also remarked that you, could, you can equally well do epsilon goes to infinity, but that requires entirely different techniques, which relates to the comment I made a minute ago. So symmetries are going to play an important role. The most important one is the continuous symmetry, so time translation invariant. This is an autonomous equation. It is nonlinear. It is non-integrable, but it's second-order autonomous, and in that sense, it is very simple. Um, there are two discrete symmetries. One is interchanging u and minus u and the other is taking epsilon to minus epsilon and t to minus t. So they're going to be more implicit in the things I say. Okay, because it's autonomous, you can graphically represent solutions schematically in the phase plane. So this is plotting the evolution of the first derivative against the function itself as time evolves um, with the arrows. There are three exceptional trajectories. The, the most important one is the limit cycle, right? So there is, there is a closed periodic orbit, the red thing, which is unstable in the direction of time I'm choosing. Um, if you start off inside the limit cycle, you spiral into the origin. Outside, and the other two exceptional connections are these ones which happen to be purple. So outside, you blow up in finite time almost always, at least in terms of the first derivative. So there's a fairly standard quadrotomy here. So th there's two ways of blowing up because of the symmetry. You can blow up at minus infinity or at plus infinity. You need two further scenarios to separate those two. So there's the non-generic case, and the, the, this is grow up as time goes to plus infinity, both the function and its derivative grow up. And we'll see how that goes in the course of the analysis. I, I meant to mention our much more complicated examples of multiple scales his introductory comments, so Grigori had a lovely one yesterday. If Valeri had got had time to get onto homogenization, that would almost certainly have had multiple scales underneath it. For the panel of eight people, um, and this exposes both my ignorance and the dysfunction of my memory, my assumption is, as, I've, as I understand it, as you go a long way out, the, the, the separation between the poles varies slowly, so that there's a fast scale associated with the pole spacing and a slow scale associated with the, the um, how far out you've gone, so how fast the spacing changes. And I assume that's been done by a variant of multiple scales. Okay, so on, on to the analysis, and I am going to work up from the ground up, I'm afraid. Apologies to people who've seen a lot of this stuff before. Um, I'm not going to apologize for that, so sorry about that, because of the comments I made earlier. 
So, so I'm going to start with the classic perturbative, per I think what the physicists call perturbative expansion. So we tend to call regular expansion. So just expanding powers of epsilon, um, gather the terms at each order. So leading order, you've just got a harmonic oscillator. Um, there's a reasonable amount of algebra on this slide because I'm going to repeatedly use it as I go through different techniques. So the leading order solution, I'm just going to write as a cosine with a phase shift phi and an amplitude a naught. You go to the first correction term, you, you bung in the dissipation on the right-hand side because that was multiplied by epsilon, and then you solve that in the standard way for linear ODEs. And the, for the record, the solution, general solution is recorded there. So the, there's immediately a problem. As time becomes very large, um, T multiplying the epsilon, which is in front of U1, specifically when T is order one over epsilon, the expansion disorders. So the perturb perturbative, which I have trouble saying, expansion breaks down, and that, that at this stage is nothing to do with any exponentials. It's just because, um, well, I'll come to that in a second. The exponentials will come in later. Okay, so you, you can kill that um, nasty term, the growing term, for a specific value of A0, which corresponds to the limit cycle. So if you get the amplitude right, this term is fine, but one of the reasons I've gone to U2 is that at the order epsilon squared, you can't kill both of these secular terms. So a bit of jargon, whenever you force this ODE with either a sine or a cosine, you get the standard resonance thing. So you get a T times a sine in, in the, uh, uh, if I got this right way around, I must have got this the wrong way around. Uh, that should be T cos, presuming that should be T sine. Um, you, but in any case, you pick up the resonance. Right, and you, you, can't, you can't kill both of them, right? You can take A1 equals zero, you can be on the limit cycle to kill the first, but you can't kill the second. And the explanation of that is very straightforward. You, this expansion is getting the period of the oscillation slightly wrong, um, and you can't deal with that by the standard power series expansion. Okay, so now, now I do stick with the limit cycle, which was implicit in some of the comments on the previous slide but I get it right, and the technique to do that is strain coordinates. So th this one gets various names. One other I'll mention is Lighthill's method, because Lighthill, like Stokes, was a Lucasian professor. So there's a kind of historical link to the Stokes phenomenon. Okay, so th the way you do it is you, you want to get the period right, and the period does depend on epsilon, which is the problem we had on the previous slide. So a constant rescaling of T to give you tor, and you pull down an omega, multiplying the derivatives now. So the, the equation transforms to this form, and then you go through exactly the same steps as before. So leading order, I'm going to prescribe the period to be 2 pi. You can prescribe it to be anything you like as long as it's a fixed value. With 2 pi, that choice is the obvious one because it gives omega naught is 1, and then the equivalent solution to what we had on the previous slide. Okay, go to next order, and you see the two secular types of secular terms appearing again. Right, the, the cosine term is the one associated with the change in period, and the sine one is associated with the change in amplitude. They are both resonant, so you have to kill them. Before, I only had one thing I could choose to do that, which was the amplitude A0, but now I've got the period as well. Okay? So this, this happened not to appear at all, um, because if omega, omega 1 ends up being 0, so the regular expansion, it doesn't appear anyway, but here it tells you that omega 1 has to be 0. And then there's the value of A naught again, and a perfectly regular solution for U1, perfectly periodic one. Okay, the second derivative, uh, sorry, sorry, order epsilon squared equation recorded here. And again, this is going to be the crucial term. The perturbation to the period is going to allow me to kill the secularities. Okay, so the, the, um, we've, we've seen most of this before. That's exactly as before. So we can kill that by our choice of A1. This one's now got an extra, ter uh, extra contribution, the omega 2, 1, which can kill the thing we couldn't deal with before. So omega 2 is minus 16. Okay, so the, the period of the oscillation up to powers epsilon squared is recorded in the box here. And that's going to be slightly relevant again in a minute, which is why it's in a box. Okay, there's a, there's a surprisingly large literature on this problem I discovered preparing the talk. And I haven't tried to track through it all. The most recent reference I found went up to 859 terms, right? And then did pad A to find where the, the um, this thing is convergent, right? So the, the, there are um, four neighbor nearest um, branch points in the complex epsilon plane. So they, they found them by pad A. So I don't do that kind of stuff. If you do and you think you're hard enough, this is probably a good test case to try. Um, they claim 100 figures of accuracy and stuff. Um, I think uh, 
Occam's razor would actually stick the singularities on the imaginary axis, so you'd only have two of them. There are four um, because of the epsilon to minus epsilon symmetry. And I'm not sure if that means anything. If anyone thinks it does, please tell me. Okay, so the other very simple limit you can do is the linearized one, and that actually has a rather similar structure to the um, limit cycle that I've just talked about. So I'm now talking as you spiral close into the origin. And so you just throw away the nonlinearity and do the simplest thing of all. And I'm going to need this for a different reason in a minute, but again, it makes the two-scale nature of the problem entirely explicit. There's dissipation on this very slow scale, and there's those oscillations on this much faster scale. Um, so again, this thing, um, again, has finite radius of convergence if you do expand it in powers of epsilon, um, so mod epsilon less than two. But the period takes this form. So it's almost exactly the same period as the limit cycle, but not quite. And that'll be important in a second. There's a sixteenth and there's an eighth. Okay, so, so finally to get on to multiple scales. Um, the procedure, um, we teach our undergraduates, and I want to raise some issues with it as I go through. You introduce this slow time scale, which is the one of dissipation that I just recorded on the previous slide. I've rewritten the ODE solely in terms of that variable, um, not because this version is important, but it makes it more recognizable if you use the singular perturbation theory where the small parameter multiplies the, um, the highest derivative. So that's a hint that there are going to be exponentials behind this which you might not observe if you just think in terms of little t. Okay, so this word pretend is going to be crucial. You, n you now pretend you've got a PDE. And throughout the rest of the talk, I'm going to have to give two distinct interpretations of many of the results, both ODE and PDE. So he here's the PDE. Um, it has got a very degenerate differential operator because you can combine the various terms because they both come from the same place. But it is to be viewed as a PDE and I'll repeatedly touch on that. Okay, so in terms of the linearization, if I relabel the constants a, a and phi, I think we called them as t naught and little t naught, you can see them as, as shifts in the time variable. So that formula is entirely equivalent to the previous slide. Okay, so, so if it really were the case that you could pretend that the two time variables are independent, this would immediately imply two things which essentially can't be true. Right, the first is that you've got double periodicity. This would be the period in little t. This, there will be imaginary period in big T because of this exponential. And secondly, you'd be able to write the general solution to the ordinary differential equation in terms of one solution with a specific behavior as t goes to infinity. So the, the solution with both constants zero would generate the general solution by shifting both time variables. So that, that clearly can't be true because there's really only one time translation invariant in the ODE. Um, so one of these two conundra is, is associated with beyond all orders, the other isn't really, and you might want to think in advance which is which. But the other, the other remark about this double periodicity is if, if, if this were true and you ran it back in time capital T until you get to the limit cycle, um, you should be picking up this period in little t um, again but we've seen you don't quite, you're off by order epsilon squared if you try and do that. Okay, so now go through the, the algebra again. And again, much of it will be very familiar and for good reason. Um, the cosine at leading order, so again, amplitude and phase are the two things you've got to deal with. Next order, um, two secular terms on the right-hand side, the resonant term in the sine and the resonant term in the cosine. The cosine one dictates the phase and therefore the period, the sine one dictates the amplitude. Um, so it, uh, to this order, the phase doesn't vary. We've seen that before. And now, whereas for the limit cycle, this thing just said A naught was four over three to the square root. We've now got an ordinary differential equation on the slow time scale for the amplitude. Okay, so there are two, two, ways of two revealing ways of representing the solution depending on whether time is increasing or time is decreasing. So I've recorded them both there, and we'll come back to that in a second. So coincidentally, this is essentially the square root of the sesh, so it's the same kind of function that John Chapman had yesterday. And in particular, a consequence of that is this thing has an infinite line of poles up the imaginary axis, sorry, infinite line of one over square root branch cuts. Okay, so that, uh, that's the first thing I've said on this slide. Um, 
So the, there's, there's various payoffs from going into the complex plane, which is something I'm now going to repeatedly do. I haven't done that yet, except mentioning the radius of convergence for the limit cycle stuff. Um, a very simple payoff is you get three for the price of one from this solution. And this also reveals something about the, the difference between whether you're increasing time or decreasing time. So if, if I shift time up by this capital T, the slow time up by distance i pi, um, it's the... Um, Oops, wrong way. It's the first representation that matters, so that, that shift brings out a minus i in front of a naught. So you need to rescale u with i. So I've done that there, and that keeps you with a real ODE, but you shifted the sign, so both dissipation terms are now of the um, physical sign. They're both genuinely dissipation. So you, there's, there's no limit cycle. Um, either forward or backwards in time, because the dissipation is all the one sign. You can't balance the negative and the positive parts. But the thing does blow up in finite backward in time. Right? So this is the expression. If I run capital T backwards, this thing's going to blow up at a finite value, which the, the solution on the real line doesn't. And correspondingly, if you, if you do the same shift um, in negative time, so you use this second representation, all you do is switch the sign in the bottom. So the, the presence of this branch point in the um, complex plane immediately has this kind of payoff in terms of the interpretation. Um, so you, this doesn't make A naught imaginary, unlike up there. Okay, so that, that's what it does do it to it. And so this is finite time blow up. Um, and at the same time as this one. So the two things have to join up, but they do represent physically completely different scenarios. The second one is swapping the interior and the exterior of the limit cycle. Um, and I go to order epsilon squared. So the, as before, um, there is quite a lot of algebra again, but it turns out here, actually, every single term you end up with is instructive. Um, so... As, as always with multiple scales, you get the information about a, gi a given um, term in the expansion at one order higher, because when I derive u naught in this form, I still u one in this form, I still don't know a one and b one. I have to go to order and epsilon squared to get them. Right. So, so the relevant um, multiples of the resonant terms are recorded on the slide, and you can solve both the ODEs for a one and b one explicitly. Um, the solution for a one is proportional to the A naught by dt. Right, so I need to pause here because we're, we're going to repeatedly see this kind of thing. So we've got the A naught by dt times cos t. So if I remind you of the leading solution um, here, A naught cos t, if I, if I perturb the time origin of capital T slightly and do the Taylor expansion, there's a d A naught by dt from there and still the cosine. Um, phi doesn't depend on t. Okay, so the, the first of the two um, secularity conditions leads to the um, type translation in capital T. The second leads to the translation in little t. So B1 multiplies the sine, and the, the factor is just A0 itself. So again, going back, if I perturb little t by a small translation um, and then do the Taylor expansion, you get sine t from there and still A0 from there. So, so both of these supposed continuous symmetries are explicitly showing up as you take the expansion to higher and higher orders. The remaining terms. Um, so the time derivative makes the singularity worse, minus 3 over 2 rather than just minus a half, and so does this. This is A0 squared times A0. So both these contributions have the same level of, sing of singularity. And as many of you recognize, that's immediately going to be important when we do the tail of the expansion. So we've seen one branch point in the complex plane, and that's where this thing is zero. But there are two more. There's ones at plus infinity and ones at minus infinity. And that kind of closes the issue of this slight um, mysterious effect that the period has changed in going from one end to the other, despite the apparent imaginary periodicity, because there are branch cuts in the um, complex capital T plane associated with these things. So you get the right exponents in both directions. Um, the right prefactors, if you work out what those branch cuts imply. Okay, so um, there's there's two ways in which the two different scales, little t and capital T, um, 
become tied back together again once you get to the end of the, the analysis. And the simpler of the two, the one doesn't involve beyond all orders, is the finite time blow up case. So that's what I'm going to do in a second, but I remind you of the picture. There's four different scenarios. You can have the derivative blowing up at minus infinity or at plus infinity, and that happens in finite time, as I'm about to describe. And then the, the exceptional cases, these are generic. Um, entire families have this behavior. The exceptional ones are these purple ones, um, where the blow up is an infinite time. But we want to see how that works both in the ODE context and the PDE context. Okay, so that the, the choice of sign in the initial data for A0 to take you outside the limit cycle sticks a minus sign in front of the exponential. So this thing blows up at some finite value of capital T. And th this is the first example I'm doing of matched asymptotics, therefore of boundary layer theory. Okay, so I rescale capital T with an amount epsilon, and the reason I want to do that is I want to bring in the nonlinearity. So to bring this thing is multiplied by epsilon, so to make the cubic term the same size as the linear terms, I need u to be of order 1 over epsilon to the half. And that's the scaling which does it, as we observe from there. But it also tells you that this scaling for tor, because big T was epsilon times little t, big tor evolves on the same time scale as little t. They're kind of the same thing. Okay, but if you do that in the PDE context, here's, here's how the PDE transforms and simplifies. You lose the linear dissipation term, but you've pulled in the nonlinear one at leading order. Matching back into the, the approach to blow up on the outer scale, matching back onto that into the inner scale, you've got this form, but you've still got the two separate variables in this interpretation. And specifically, that means because t and tor are separate, you can subtract phi off from t by translating. Um, so phi can't possibly play any role in the solution to this problem. Um, so it will, in, in particular, it'll still be 2 pi periodic in little t. Um, so that is a PDE problem. If you continued it into the complex plane, you get a pile of different singularities and things. I'll touch on a related point later. Um, but it, it, you don't violate the statements I made earlier on about the, um, the, the time translation invariance and so on. But in the ODE version, you do, and it's now crucial that the two variables are really the same thing. So with this transformation of big T, the transformation of little t looks like that. And then the phase shift, th this, is, um, this is large with respect to epsilon, but it's inside a cosine. So you treat this thing in effect as being order one by taking mod two pi. So that's not asymptotically inconsistent, though it may look it. So the ODE version of the inner problem is recorded here, equivalent to here, but only one time variable, because tor and t are essentially the same thing. And now it's an initial value problem for an ODE, where only tor appears. Um, phi appears as a um, constant required in doing the matching in prescribing the initial conditions on the, the ODE. But you can't subtract it off anymore, because you'd mess up this thing. So what happens with that ODE? Well, it's still, a, it's still a real ODE, of course. You're still on the real line, so you can do the phase plane of the simpler ODE and convince yourself what's going on. Identify the possible forms of um, singular behavior and then check self-consistency. So if, if you do that with that nonlinear ODE, you find that the type of singularity that's generic, um, there's an additional term in the expansion that has an arbitrary constant in it, which is why it's generic. This, this tor C is also arbitrary. So there are two degrees of freedom, and therefore generic for a second order ODE. Um, you get the square root behavior as you'll blow up. So the first derivative blows up like um, one over the square root. And the, the dominant balance in the ODE is between the nonlinear dissipation and the second derivative. So that's generic. The non-generic case, um, where the only degree of freedom is a shift in tor. So this, isn't, this is an exceptional type of behavior for the initial value problem. Um, this is the grow up you see, it grows up like 3 over 2. Um, there's no degrees of freedom beyond that except the translation of tor. And that, that's the dominant balance. It's essentially the opposite case as where you dominate the balance nonlinear dissipation against the V0 term. Okay, so psi is crucial, right? So which of these you see, whether it blows up at plus infinity or minus infinity, or whether you happen to have a, a very specific value of psi that puts you on the purple curves. <coughs> 
crucially depends on the how psi arises here. So you, um, you genuinely can't treat the two scales as separate. Okay, the, the second case inside the limit cycle, the corresponding analysis has to go to beyond all orders, which is probably the thing of most interest to this audience. Okay, so um, when you do beyond all orders, one of the first things you do is probably, one of the first things you probably do is think about the continuation into the complex plane. So I'm going to do that in terms of the little t complex plane, um, which is in effect the ODE interpretation of the thing. And we're going to see that the continuation into the complex plane essentially gives you absolute, tells you absolutely nothing um, about non-perturbative effects. Okay, so that there's, no, there's in, effect, in effect no Stokes phenomenon coming out of this analysis. Okay, so what, what, what's the thing that you have to worry about that, um, that drives your analysis? Remember that the, in terms of little t, we've got this cosine, which on the real axis is entirely innocuous. It's just oscillating up and down. But as soon as you go, up in the, go off in the imaginary direction, one or, one or other of these two things is growing exponentially. So the shift I'm going to make, and this glosses over a slight subtlety that doesn't change anything. If you, if you shift t by log 1 over epsilon, this thing becomes order 1 over epsilon to the half. And as we've seen, that's the rescaling you need to bring in the nonlinearity of leading order. This term becomes of order epsilon, epsilon to the plus a half, so is negligible in terms of the matching. So with this change of variables and this shift um, to do with the amplitude is important in terms of how I've drawn these red curves down the bottom. Um, that term doesn't matter when you do the matching because it's uh, epsilon smaller than this term. So the matching only relies on the second of those two exponentials. So here's the initial value problem going up in the imaginary direction. There's the rewritten ODE. There's the, um, the initial conditions you need to impose on it. Um, so you do have, I mean, one point, you, you do retain the periodicity um, because I've switch, switched direction. This thing now has two pi i periodicity in terms of s. Okay, so this is complex because it's got an i in front of it. Um, so in, in effect, it's a fourth order system. So it's not straightforward to analyze that. But fortunately, there are, there are two sets of rays in which you, it collapses onto a real and therefore second order equation where you can fully understand it by phase plane, etc. So the two sets of rays is if I shift s by pi by 4 and various multiples of things, um, v naught takes this phase, which means you're multiplying this thing by minus i, so uh, no, plus i, yeah, plus i. So that thing becomes positive, but then I shift the sign, so it ends up with a minus. So this, this is the real ODE on these little blue directions. Um, it, it blows up at finite s for the same reason as before, although the balance is different. Event essentially, when you do this analysis, you get every possible version of the original equation. Right, so it's closely related to this thing, but in neither case do you have the same sign everywhere. So here's the real ODE. Here's the generic form of blow-up. The non-generic case has disappeared now because of the difference in sign. And so you've got this, this, these very closely spaced, in terms of capital T at least, um, branch points in the complex plane. If you're inside the limit cycle, A naught is a decreasing function of T. So as you increase time, this thing curves up. It moves away from the real axis. The converse occurs uh, outside the limit cycle, whereas as, as you approach the blow-up time, um, the thing hits the real axis. And that was the thing I ana analyzed a couple of slides ago. That's that purple circle. Okay, so that, that tells you that there's a very large array of singularities as you go off in the imaginary direction. I mean, I, I conjecture that these are the only ones, although I, a priori that's not clear. There, there might be solutions in inter on intervening rays where you've really got a fourth order system where you also get singularities. So incidentally, the solving these things in com the complex plane numerically is not the sort of thing I do. So again, if, if there are people interested in following that up, please let me know. Um, one of the points of this slide is even this very innocuous looking ODE has very complicated complex plane structure. Right, the, uh, the other trajectory is these green ones, you shift, there's a, there's a sign difference in how you shift the thing. So there's a plus sign there. And this thing is well behaved. It, it goes to the other thing we s which was non-generic in the previous case, but now is generic because of the difference in signs. So on these green curves, you can get all the way up to infinity without running into any trouble. Um, but there, there are branch cuts intervening between them. 
Okay, so, so the, the, the first thing in many of our toolkits in terms of doing beyond all orders would be to do this an analytic continuation, but it's in some sense completely useless if you do it in terms of little t. But it's interesting in terms of the comp complication of the complex plane structure. Okay, so n now onto something which is possibly the most recognizable thing so far to many of you, and that, that is the tail. Okay, so he here's my PDE. Um, where I'm collecting together terms at order epsilon to the power n. So on the double fast time scale there's this one, on the one slow time derivative it's one exponent lower, two exponents lower on the second derivative. That's how the dissipation terms go. And then there's the entire expansion here involving du1 by dt, et cetera, in here. Um, that is a little t, I've written it very badly. Um, and then there's the linear term off the end. Okay, so th those are all the terms I need to keep to do the, the large n expansion. So here's the familiar factorial over power ansatz. One point to make about that is the singulant depends only on the slow time scale. You can't get a sensible balance if it involves little t as well. And then there's these prefactors which are thought alpha naught and alpha one. And they'll take a very recognizable form in a minute. Okay, so collect together all the leading terms which are involved with this gamma function. This is the ODE you get. Um, so often, the, the in non-multiple scale problems, I guess you, you know immediately what the singulant is. It, there's an equation for it, rather than it just appearing in effect as an eigenvalue in this equation on the fast time scale. So the way, the way you have to fix it, and we've already saw this kind of thing, of course, too, is um, you know that you've got this periodicity in little t. So the, these quantities here need to be two pi periodic in little t. And if you go through the calculation, you find dx by d big t, this factor here and here, has to be i times an integer. Okay? So, uh, so, and so with that choice, you find alpha naught takes this form where we don't know omega plus or omega minus yet. This is a multiple scales problem, so even in the tail, you need to go to a solvability condition. I need to go to next order as well before I get even the leading solution. Okay, so n is an arbitrary integer. So there's an infinite number of possibilities here. Because of the chi to the n on the bottom, the larger n is, um, the more subdominant it, it, that it is. So n is plus or minus one. They're gonna be the biggest terms. Okay, so uh, we, need to, we need to integrate up this ordinary differential equation for the singulant, and as usual, um, we do that, we identify the constant of integration by knowing where the singularities of the leading solution are. And each time you go to higher order, as we've seen, you make the singularity worse, but you don't change where the um, singular point is. So this thing has singularities at these points, and therefore they have to be where chi is zero, because that's where the, singular the singularities are here. So this, this is your choice for chi. Okay, so to go to next order to get the solvability condition that'll determine those omega plus and omega minuses, uh, left-hand side, as it was for alpha naught, as will always be the case, and then the right-hand side ends up involving these quantities recorded there. Um, so there are secular terms, again. Um, they're of a slightly different type than in the leading order calculations because these are the things in the complementary function, so these are the things that resonate with this right-hand side. So you need to kill them off. So you do the algebra and the usual thing about whether that should be sine squared. You d use the multiple angle formula and everything, and you end up with these two conditions for your omegas. Um, so here, here um, combining these two, taking plus and minuses, you get, um, you decouple the equations for the various combinations of the, uh, uh, the omegas, and these are your solutions. Right, and this is a misprint, that should be capital T. So having done that, we've now fixed alpha naught completely up to arbitrary constants K1 and K2 that you'd have to give, get numerically. But again, I'm gonna subject you to reminding you what those things mean again. Um, no, I won't scroll back. So remember the leading order solution was A naught cos T. I've been five for brevity here. So the ti little time derivative of A naught cos T is this thing here. Um, the big T derivative is this thing here when you correct my misprint. So I implicit in this formula are, are shifts in the origin of little t and of big t, exponentially small shifts. 
and they're manifested in what's turned on. So here's, I haven't done the Stokes smoothing and so on, but the, the standard recipes tell you the, the nature of the quantities that are turned on, on up to the Stokes multipliers that I haven't calculated. So what does the Stokes switching do? Um, the Stokes lines all run down from the singularities, which have real part of T naught, so they're, they're vertical in the complex capital T plane. The things they turn on are this exponentially small multiple, which depends both on the mode number n and on the singularity m. There's this infinite row of singularities up the imaginary axis. Um, here's the thing, um, right, the, the stuff we found, here's the thing that came out, no, rewind. Here's, here's the thing the singularity turn, um, turns on by the Stokes phenomenon. The rest of it, the e to the int times sine t, is the thing that came out of the solvability condition for the omegas. So that, that's the thing that's turned on associated with translations in little t. There's something turned on associated with translations in big t as well. Turns out to be a, a, a slightly smaller, factor epsilon smaller, because gammas are different. And the way you work out the gammas, because we've got gamma to the n, uh, chi to the n plus gamma on the denominator on the previous slide, this thing has a different level of singularity than this by one. So the gammas are different by one. And this thing, well, they've got the same exponential dependence on epsilon, but this one is slightly smaller algebraically. So that all those things in general get switched on. Okay, and, and now I go back to the complex plane. I stated that when I did it in terms of little t, it gave you essentially no useful information, though it was sort of interesting. In terms of big T, it does. And I'm going to have to go through this and then, again, reinterpret things in terms of the OD as well. So as I say, I'm, um, th this is the complex plane inner solution, the turning point, or depending on your history, the kind of thing, the way Crystal Seeger did things. Um, I'm going to make capital T complex, as I've already stated. Um, I don't see any virtue in making little t complex at the same time, so I'm going to keep that real. Um, we've seen throughout that the thing is Im has imaginary periodicity in t, so there are this infinite array of um, turning point problems as you go up the imaginary axis. Here's the rescaling, and it's now familiar. You rescale time in a way that actually makes tor and t little t in some sense equivalent. You rescale u in order to bring down the, um, the nonlinearities, uh, sorry, to pull in the nonlinearity at leading order. Okay, so here, here's what the turning point problem looks like. Um, and crucially, it is a PDE. So, and I should have said this with the earlier example as well, it's a PDE because the, the, the way in which you have to prescribe the dependence of, on tor and t differs. So it's a boundary value problem in little t associated with the periodicity we've had throughout. But in terms of um, tor, it's an initial value problem. You can come in from either direction. I happen to be coming in from the right here. So as you come in from the right from the multiple scale solution, we know this is the leading term. Um, in the far field for um, V naught, and the sign depends which singularities you're sitting on. Okay, so boundary, if initial boundary value problem, initial conditions in one variable, um, boundary conditions in the other. So, so the, the structure of the turning point is, is standard. The, there are anti-Stokes lines which run in the real direction, and you think of those as being a, a balance where the higher harmonics are coming in a different algebraic order from the leading but not exponentially smaller order. And the Stokes lines in the far field of the turning point problem are up the imaginary axis. So if, if this is above the real axis, the one coming down will hit the real axis and therefore turn on a relevant exponentially small contribution. But I, I emphasize the point, this thing is a PDE. So if you were to solve it numerically, you'd find a pile of singularities and branch cuts and things in this thing. The, 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 all, all the original beyond all orders calculations of this type that I know of have ODEs as your turning point problem. Okay, so um, what are we left with? Um, first point is, is to come back to a comment on trans series. So the, the, the things you turn on are of this type, and if you're used to doing trans series on nonlinear problems, you'll recognize it. It's, it's arbitrary products of e to the minus pi over epsilon. The thing that happens here, and I don't know how, op, in what other context this arises, it must do. There are three different sources of each of 
beyond the leading one, there are three different sources of these kinds of exponentials. There's the nonlinearities, which I haven't talked about at all, in effect, beyond doing the solvability conditions and things. So nonlinearities will reproduce the original e to the minus pi over epsilon, and you'll get the entire lattice of them. But also the different harmonics, n, will give you different um, exponentials, and so will the different um, singularities, m. So there are three, diff three entirely distinct sources of the tra same trans series, and I don't know how that would manifest itself if you did that kind of calculation. Um, then going back the, to the double interpretation, with the PDE, which is how I've derived these exponentially small terms, um, to go back to what's being turned on, well, you are turning on different harmonics in terms of little t. You're turning on these things, and the, the modulation with respect to big T happens to be of that type. There's only one thing I know. I, sh I should have said, uh, t naught here is real, so this thing is fine. The thing that makes it exponentially small is the imaginary part of the singularity location, which came in there. Okay, so the, the, in terms of the PDE, you're turning on harmonics. In terms of ODEs, you have to remember your two time variables are they're the same again. So th this is where the, in terms of when you're inside the limit cycle, where the slaving of the two time variables is crucial. So it's no coincidence that this is capital T over epsilon and this is little t. So when you remember how they relate, you just cancel that. So in terms of little t, you're not turning on harmonics at all. You're turning on the, the, um, the translation invariance, as I've repeatedly talked about. Um, there's an exponentially small prefactor. There's a phase modulation here, which I'll come back to in a second, because that's sort of important to close my story. And these are the two things you turn on. Okay, so this fact phase factors are important, right? I, I said at the beginning, there's this, this apparent situation that you can shift little t and big T by arbitrary constants and um, reconstruct your general solution from one specific solution. But it's clear from this you can't do that, right? Because if, if the value of t naught is crucial in terms of where your origin of little t is, for example, okay, the two don't decouple but their dependencies only come in at exponentially small orders. So the thing we tell undergraduates that you treat the two variables as independent is, pretty, is on pretty safe ground, but it does fail when you start worrying about exponentially small terms. And it kind of has to fail because they really are the same variable. Okay, so my concluding remarks. Um, this is where I came in. I've gone through a variety of approaches, strain coordinates, mass asymptotics, multiple scales, um, beyond all orders. I would claim it's useful to have all those tools in your toolkit to understand these problems as comprehensively as you might want to, and I get a bit obsessive about these. So my other motivation in doing this problem, incidentally, was to remind myself how multiple scales work. Um, but I was kind of pleased how things came through because I understood things I didn't understand before. Okay, if you're doing multiple scales, it's worth thinking in terms of both the original ODE and the PDE because um, both those arguments give you different kind of insights. Continuation to the complex plane is, is useful, but not terribly useful in some other contexts. Um, but you, all, you must always do it, right? The, the, the simple thing where I got three for the price of one was the simplest application of it, where I did the beyond all orders effects was the most complicated. Right, the, this is a comment for the cogn cognoscenti that I'm gonna, uh, I choose not to explain. But if you know about these things, talk to me. I don't do these kind of things numerically, and if, if anyone is interested in doing so, please let me know. I've, there's various things I'd be very interested to see. And finally, I thought it, it would be apposite to end with a quote from the U. Um, so I, st I deliberately chose kind of the simplest problem of this, of this type that I could think of. And even this one does get pretty complicated and does, I think, give you some useful insights. So I finish with that. Thank you. Hi, John. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm a bit confused about one issue. Uh, in a method of multiple scale, when you have a PDE, mm -hmm. uh, the PDE allows more general solutions than the OD, original ODE. And it's only through the 
capital T is epsilon T, that's when you get to the ODE solutions, correct? Right, when, when you started saying PDE, you do mean multiple scales on an ODE that gives you P of PDE yeah, yeah. rather multiple scales yeah, on yeah. a PDE. Yeah, so that PDE yeah, has so a more, gen more general solution. Yeah, but the thing you have to remember is if, if you're prescribing initial data on the ODE, they transform into in initial data that close your problem to the PDE as well. So although the PDE has far more solutions, once you impose initial data... Yeah, but, but that brings to the second point, which is you complexified capital T, mm -hmm. but c left small t uh, real. So doesn't it lead to some sort of a, um, uh, what do you call, um, um, a contradiction in terms of um, consistency? The, the, the PDE problem is fine. If you, if you, so if you interpret it as a solution to the PDE, I believe it's fine. If you reinterpret it as in terms of the ODE, I, my inference is that the lack of consistency is precisely the thing that leads to the switching at the end. I don't... Um, right, no, I've, I've now got a better answer. The point is big T is, is a lot further away than little t. So if, if you were to re... Right. I've got two entirely contradictory answers to the question, and I don't know which one to give you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, there, let me mention another example. So the, the first example I did of this type was Kuromotsu-Tosinski, and there there's a natural boundary with respect to little t, which intrudes before the singularities in big T. So the big T complex plane had absolutely nothing to do with the little t solution, but did tell you the tale of the expansion. Right, so the algebraic co calculation that gives you the exponentially small terms is fine. The complex plane interpretation is not. Um, so I think my answer to your question is that the, the complex plane for the PDE, where you treat the two variables as different, is, is fine um, because they're genuinely different, so you can do one at a time. In terms of the ODE, the complex plane for big T may have nothing to do with little t, but does tell you what the exponentially small terms are. You may not regard that as a satisfactory answer. So. Hi, John. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, because you're talking about multiple scales in the complex plane, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, so the original uh, example you gave where you were led to identically zero coefficients because you didn't strain the variable um, is actually a very instructive problem when you're looking at Panlevé equations. Um, if you look at the Panlevé equations in the complex T plane, the independent variable plane, you have two periods because you're looking at slowly changing elliptic functions. And in order to apply this philosophy, you have to strain two variables in order to fix the periods. And as soon as you do that, what you're doing is fixing um, things with a non-conformal map. Because if it was conformal, you'd keep the same angles in your period parallelogram and that can't stay the same everywhere. So there's a very interesting nuance that comes out with multiple scales methods that may or may not be useful in other contexts here, but may be useful if you come across doubly periodic mm -hmm. behaviors. Mm -hmm. I just thought I'd mention that. Thank you, Panini. I wish I understood Panama better than I do, because it's probably obvious. Well, Any time. <laughs> Great, just thank him again. Thank you. Oh, you need that, yeah.